Good afternoon and welcome to Purdue University and the Sirius uh, Computer Security Seminar. Our speaker today is Umit Topkara, PhD uh, candidate in the Computer Science Department here at Purdue. Uh, he has worked on a variety of problems in information security ranging from covert communication to today's talk in a past life. Uh, during his master's at uh, Bill Kent uh, and a stint at Carnegie Mellon, uh, he worked on language models for speech recognition also holds a bachelor's from Bill Kent. His uh, topic today is Passwords Decay, Words Endure Towards a Secure and Reusable multi, uh, Multiple Password uh, Mnemonics. Umut. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Umut Topkara. Today I'm going to talk about um, our uh, work on uh, making password authentication more usable by using uh, mnemonics. Um, my collaborators in this work was uh, Marjan Topkara, uh, Mike Atala, and uh, Sundar Jayaraman. Here, um, we're concerned about a user um, and, and uh, how he authenticates or he or she authenticates himself uh, to the uh, to a computer system. In this case, our our user has chosen a password Dusty ninety nine. Well, we all know that this is not a good password. Um, ideally, a good password should be a, ran a random string that is consisting of uh, lowercase and uppercase characters. It should have numbers and symbols in it. Um, but on the other hand, uh, such passwords are very hard to remember. And it's even harder to remember two of these passwords. And let's not even talk about when you have to remember 10 of these passwords. So what do we do in this case? Um, we know that 50% of the users who have to use uh, random passwords actually write down their passwords. And um, some of them forget about just, like they say just uh, forget about um, remember, having to remember random passwords. I'm just going to use something that I can remember rather than something random. Fortunately, there are other ways to authenticate yourself. Um, passwords, passwords only one of them are only one of them, and they're 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 uh, something you know. They're, they they should be an authentication uh, based on something you know. Uh, you could authenticate uh, yourself based on something you have, uh, which is the case when you use a smart card or a um, secure ID token, or it, you could authenticate by um, something you are. Uh, which is the case when you use your uh, fingerprint to authenticate yourself. There are also alternate solutions um, uh, to, uh, w within the password realm. For instance, uh, you know, graphical passwords is an example to that. Or uh, you could also use a browser plugin that also that securely stores your passwords. The problem is that um, alternative authentication methods and uh, this kind of alternative solutions to passwords uh, either re require a change to the infrastructure or um, they require an ex uh, a, a trusted computing power in the case of uh, brow browser plugins. So you cannot just uh, take, your, uh, take all your password-based uh, systems and apply one of these. So what we so the solution that we're we're uh, looking for is uh, within the realm of text passwords themselves. So let's look at um, the let's look at closer to the text passwords. Passwords are a, a type of uh, unilateral authentication. That is, um, you authenticate yourself to the to the server um, as opposed to both of you uh, uh, authenticating each other to uh, authenticating um, yourselves to each other. 
Um, the security is based on a shared secret between you and, you and the system, which is uh, most of the time uh, like six to ten character uh, character string, or it could be a, a four-digit uh, number in the case of uh, pin numbers to the ATMs. And ideally, uh, I'm sorry. Um, so what? What happens at each authentication session, uh, you first uh, present a claim uh, that you say, okay, I am the owner of this login, I'm the rightful owner of this uh, login, and, I, um, and you, pr you present the password as an evidence uh, uh, to, to this uh, claim. And uh, as we all know, passwords are uh, the, the most widely used authentication uh, method for um, computer systems. Of course, in, in daily life, you, you use your uh, you use uh, your ID cards, or you, you know you you recognize people by face, or uh, maybe voice. Um, the security of passwords depends on several factors. Um, first and foremost, uh, it's the the confidentiality of the the passwords that makes it secure. Um, a password should be only known by the, the rightful owner of it. You shouldn't write it down uh, so that it can be read by others, uh, or you shouldn't write, uh, you shouldn't use it as a password in another system, um, or or you could you shouldn't tell them to any to tell it to anybody else. And also, uh, the security also depends on the complexity of the password. If your password is easy to get to guess. Um, it can no longer guarantee that um, knowledge of the password will uh, will uh, be a proof that you, uh, the, the the person who presents the password is the rightful owner of the of the um, the login. Um, you can also uh, provide security of uh, password authentication by um, enforcing rules on the on the usage of them. For instance, you can say, well, um, you have to change your password uh, every, every day, uh, which is going to immediately increase, uh, increase the security provided by that password, if you can use it, of course. And um, also, the, the security of password depends on the context that you use it. If you type your password uh, just right by uh, somebody else uh, that you don't know and uh, they can see the password, that password is no longer secure. It's, it's already being compromised and can be used by somebody else. And also, um, the software and the hardware that you use uh, along with the uh, post password authentication uh, affects the security provided by uh, the passwords. Now let's talk about the, the attacks by the adversaries um, to uh, password authentication. The, the easiest one would be uh, stealing and spying. It is um, if you have written your password on a, on a piece of paper and you left it on your desk, or you, you wrote your passwords on, a, on a, like a, a computer file and you save them to a, a directory that you, you think it's hard to reach, or if uh, there are systems that um, <clears throat> save, the pa save your passwords into cookies, then you're in trouble. Actually, uh, somebody um, you know, coming to your desk when uh, you don't have uh, the, the, the computer locked or you're still logged in um, can go in and find out your, that file and read and uh, learn your passwords, or they can go through your drawer and find out the piece of paper that have, the, that have all your passwords. Well, another method uh, that the attackers use to gain your passwords is social engineering. Um, well, they, what they do is they just ask. They just ask you to, to tell your passwords. And surprisingly, a lot of people actually tell their passwords uh, or, uh, you know, would help people that, that are asking for help, uh, asking uh, to get access to a computer system. Um, so obviously the attacker here uses uh, social pressure or uh, professional pressure, and um, and actually uh, this is one of the one of the uh, methods that are used in audit processes by the um, co uh, security consultants. One of my friends actually uh, has has done this uh, in his as a part of his job. He has uh, authenticate. He has uh, passed the, um, the security by just telling that uh, he had an appointment with a very important person. And when he got to the floor, uh, he was able to get into the uh, the server room uh, because he told that uh, he was he was actually uh, going to maintain the system. 
uh, to just increase the performance. And of course, the employees were already complaining about the performance, and they just let him in, uh, along with the passwords. <laughs> Another method is um, phishing or uh, spoofing. In this case, um, uh, the ad adversary convinces the, uh, the users uh, about a, a false identity, um, uh, this time online. Uh, you, you know, we, we always uh, get emails or we see websites that look like, uh, you know, some, some bank or, or which, uh, but they are actually not, uh, you know, legitimate sites. Uh, so what, what uh, in this kind of attack, what happens is uh, the adversary asks you to uh, enter your passwords and login name, and they just store these uh, to be used later. And to increase the um, the um, <clears throat> the convincing uh, to to make to make it more convincing, they usually just forward you to the uh, to the legitimate site, so you don't know that you have uh, you know you have given your password. Um, an alternative method is uh, uh, snooping and and, and shoulder <coughs> surfing. In this case, um, the adversary just observes you. Uh, while you're while you're typing your password, uh, this if uh, if the adversary um, uh, physically observes you, it's called uh, shoulder surfing, and it could happen in the labs here, or it could happen in the airport, or it could happen in a in a in a plane when you're uh, sitting uh, next to another passenger, or uh, somebody could install uh, video cameras and get your passwords. An interesting one is um, actually uh, uh, capturing the passwords by using microphones. This works with the ATMs. Uh, in the past, ATMs used to uh, give a different beep for every key. And if you were able to uh, record this uh, uh, sequence of beeps, you, you were able to uh, retrieve the, the, the PIN number of a, of a, per, of a customer. Another surprising, uh, surprisingly frequent attack is is guessing. Um, this is usually done by the closed circle of a of a user. If I know the, the if I know your birthday or your your uh, close relatives names or your pet's name, I can actually uh, type it and see whether it's actually your password. And this uh, works a lot of the time. This works. And um, another another method is uh, if I know. Uh, Let's say I know that I know your Hotmail password, and I want. And uh, there is a, a high chance that you're using your Hotmail password for your Yahoo account too. So I can use the, the that knowledge to uh, to access your Yahoo account, which would also uh, work as guessing. If if nothing else works, you could also do brute force attack, or an adversary could do a brute force attack. In this case. Uh, what they do is they just, um, you know, start a computer program that just uh, repeatedly tries different different uh, passwords that could be, uh, you know, that, that you could have used. Um, well, most of the time, uh, these these attacks should not work in, in in theory because the password space is so huge. But the the problem is that uh, we as humans uh, do not, you know, use random passwords. And uh, if the uh, the brute force attack uh, program is clever, they can actually break the password much less in a much less time than it is expected theoretically. A similar attack is a dictionary attack. In this case, um, actually, um, first the adversary steals the password file, and then, um, well, as we know that the, the, in the password file the the passwords are encrypted, but. Um, the adversary in this case uses a dictionary of co uh, encrypted common passwords and compare these passwords with the password file that uh, he or she has stolen. And uh, most of the time, they can break um, a lot of passwords in this, in this, by using this method. <coughs> so what are, what are the com uh, countermeasures. So, uh, well, um, we all know from now that uh, we we, uh, we have been uh, computer users for a long time. Uh, it's now our common sense that we shouldn't trust emails. Uh, we shouldn't download software from untrusted uh, sources. We shouldn't uh, click on suspicious links. And um, 
if possible, we should use a dedicated secure computer to access um, uh, important, important information such as our bank or um, school account or work account. And also, and also uh, we should check the security signs. We should, we should see whether there's a lock icon on the, on the bottom right corner or there's a message on the top of the uh, browser screen that says, uh, you know, the, there, there might be a problem. And um, well, if and of course this this works for us because we have been using the computers for a long time, uh, and for the users that are not uh, familiar with this kind of uh, information, um, we know that education should work, uh, should work, and they should, you know, uh, they as soon as they learn about these things, um, the attacks that abuse this kind of uh, vulnerabilities uh, will work will work less. Another way that we could we could increase the security is, as we said, uh, policies. Um, there are policies that that force people um, not to give password their passwords over the phone or to their uh, peers. Or um, there are also policies that force you um, to not write your passwords. Um, and and also, um, you know, you could have also implement systems that make sure that users use different passwords on each of the in each of your uh, computer accounts, and uh, you could also implement. A, uh, I guess Purdue is implementing this one, uh, a policy that that enforces the users to change their passwords very frequently, and uh, you could also enforce uh, good password gu guidelines such that all the passwords have to have um, uppercase, lowercase characters, symbols, and numbers. But unfortunately, the problem is. Um, the users do not obey these, and they find workarounds. They they change that back their passwords as soon as they change it to a new one. They they do increments of their passwords that so they you know the first password is password one, the second you know after they change they make it password two and so on. They still go on writing writing down their passwords even though they know that uh, you know this is against the policies. Uh, they share their passwords uh, within the company because uh, you know because of peer pressure. Uh, because of the fear that they would be uh, labeled as uh, uh, paranoids or labeled as not trusting their peers if they don't share their passwords. Or <clears throat> um, they just use non-compliant passwords. If the password uh, policy is just uh, on paper but not uh, enforced by the system, you know, you, uh, the users just continue using non-compliant passwords, even though they know that that's going to reduce their security. Or they use easy to guess passwords, uh, like their um, you know uh, relatives' names, and um, most impo importantly, they share passwords across systems because um, it this is hard to enforce by a, by a, a company. You cannot enforce uh, the user not to use their uh, company passwords as their Yahoo password or a Hotmail password. And another interesting one is this. This is done by usually done by doctors, and they actually uh, rely on their uh, secretaries or other subordinates to remember their passwords because they think that you know uh, their job is not to remember passwords. They have more important stuff to to deal with. The reason that that all these workarounds occur is because uh, we ha we don't have a strong enough memory to comply with all these uh, policies. Um, obviously, we need a strong memory to to remember all those uh, random passwords. But it has been shown that um, you, uh, humans have a, a, a very short, uh, sh uh, very limited short-term memory. Uh, in a study uh, by Miller, uh, it has been shown that our sh short-term memory is uh, limited to uh, chunks of seven items, and also. Uh, it is. It is. It, in the same study, it has been shown that uh, it's easier for humans to remember related sequences of same length than uh, compared to unrelated sequences. Um, I'll give uh, more examples about this in a, in a minute. And um, another thing is we memorize by repetition. So. If, if a policy dictates that you should uh, change your password every day, you don't have a, a much chance to repeat your password, so you will probably forget your password, and you will have to find another way to, to manage that uh, uh, password uh, change frequency. 
And also, um, if, you, if you change between, uh, let's say, locations and you have to use different <laughs> systems in, in different locations, which um, I guess is very common in the, in the corporate environments now, um, then uh, you tend to forget your passwords that you haven't used for a long time. And um, <clears throat> the situation gets even worse when you have to remember multiple of these passwords or now uh, a small number of them. And um, of course, the, if you if you forget a password, it was it costs you time because you have to go and uh, ask for a password reset, or you have to uh, go through you know uh, all that red tape to have a new password assigned to you. Or maybe if you don't readily have a, a help desk, you might have to wait another day for the um, people in the help desk to come back and assign you a new password. So. Obviously, what users do is they just use the least effort way to, um, to, to, to solve this problem, which is you know, uh, the solutions that we discussed earlier. Or some of the users use uh, mnemonics. Well, the rest of the presentation is going to talk about, uh, about uh, reminders, of the reminders that the users uh, use to remember their um, complex passwords. So let's see what what a, mnemo, what a mnemonic is. Mnemonic is actually a reminder for hard to remember information, um, such as an unrelated sequence of objects. Many of you might know that uh, ve my very eager mother just sued us new pajamas is a is a mnemonic for the the planets of the solar system. If you look at the first letters of the of the sentence, you you will find the first letters of the planets in in the solar system. Including Pluto, uh, <clears throat> yeah, which is no longer. Um, okay, so uh, Miller, uh, the, the study of Miller uh, has actually f uh, s uh, listed the the strengths of the human memory, which works as a guideline for us to f to find out uh, good uh, mnemonic sentences or mnemonics for for passwords. So uh, we know that we now know that. Uh, Semantic association is a, is a good way to uh, to recall. For instance, if you if you uh, if you if you associate the, the the map of Manhattan to a to an apple or a map of Italy to a boot, you can easily uh, recall them. And, and you know when you're in, when you when you're asked to uh, draw it, you can easily draw that. And um, if you make if you make uh, this random information, if you could make in this random information into a progression of ideas, or a, that is like if you can connect them as a story, you can easily remember them. For instance, if you want to remember the uh, first digits of the, the number pi, you can, you can just uh, count the letters in the sentence. May I have a large container of coffee? So obviously, um, um, uh, this this is much much easier than remembering three one uh, four one five nine two six. And um, another another finding was that if you have mnemonics that uh, mnemonics that are uh, that have a uh, syntactic coherence, such as if they're if they're grammatical, uh, the the people have an easier time uh, remembering them compared to ungrammatical sentences. So it's not enough if you just uh, you know. Put uh, put out a, uh, a sequence of words. Uh, you have to also make them uh, grammatical. And um, another trick in uh, creating mnemonics is, you know, if you can chunk information into uh, uh, chunk information, uh, you can actually uh, make it easier for people to remember. Uh, in this example, uh, we have this uh, 12, 12 bits uh, string. Uh, one one zero one zero one one zero one one zero zero, uh, which I don't think I will be able to remember now, but I could remember uh, thirteen six twelve, um, you know, five seconds from now thirteen six twelve, and but I cannot repeat the 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 bit string. <coughs> so what's wrong with the mnemonics? The problem is that. Uh, you, people do not know do not know how to use them. Do not do not know the existence of them most of the time, 
And, um, and also, uh, we know that the, if you come up with a mnemonic for your password, uh, it has to be a, an easy to remember one. Uh, such as a riddle, an apple a day uh, sends doctor away. And also they have to be hard to guess. Uh, this is, which is uh, very problem problematic because uh, the, the, the human languages, are, they usually have a lot of redundancy. Um, for instance, uh, you, you even have systems that, you, that uh, use this redundancy uh, to make speech recognizers or um, uh, grammar correctors and, you know, uh, similar natural language processing tools. So, um, in short, you have to you have to be able to uh, put a high entropy into your into your mnemonic sentence, and also um, maybe you might be good in uh, creating of uh, one mnemonic for for your uh, for your account. But if you have to re uh, create uh, several mnemonics for all your accounts, then uh, you might have a very hard time. Uh, ensuring that uh, the mnemonic that you create is going to yield a, a good password. And also, you know, if you have a policy that, has, that, that forces you to change your password periodically, that's also going to uh, create a lot of uh, strain on your uh, mnemonic creation abilities. So people have looked at um, automatic generation of mnemonics. So um, well, one way you could is you could generate uh, you could automatically generate stories. Um, but the problem is that uh, it's hard to generate st stories uh, automatically because uh, you can only achieve uh, this for uh, limited domains and and uh, this technology is not intended for for mnemonics if you y use it for mnemonics. There are also uh, methods that are developed uh, exclusively for generating mnemonics. One is a uh, template-based generation. Here, uh, in this example, uh, by Jones et al., et al. Uh, the, uh, the mnemonic sentences gen are generated from templates <coughs> that of uh, part of speech, part of uh, a sequence of part of speech, who, uh, uh, which normally generate a normal uh, ge generate a sentence. For instance, you can generate this um, random-looking password with the um, by using the first letters of the uh, first letters of the, uh, the your your mnemonic Mark's Canary illustrates Dylan's ninth haddock, and also uh, uh, here, uh, if you look, um, the exclamation mark can be uh, generated from the uh, the name mark. And the number nine could be generated from the number ninth uh, or the uh, numeral ninth in the in the sentence. Another example here. Um, a similar system was uh, uh, proposed by Atala and McDonough. Uh, in that case, they have uh, they they have they used a manually <laughs> created and uh, limited template sets uh, similar to John's et al. And um, <clears throat> the problem is that um, the the temp the, the systems generated, or the, the password mnemonics generated by this way, have, uh, you know, they, they don't have a semantic uh, richness and uh, they, they are uh, weak in coherence. Okay, in, in the system that we're proposing now, um, we want to use uh, news headlines as, as uh, sources for our mnemonics. Because uh, they have the, they have are uh, they have some nice uh, desirable uh, characteristics. First of all, they're easy to understand because uh, you know they, that's what you sh that's what you see the first time you look at the newspaper. And they're usually concise summaries of the events that are described in the longer article under them. And they are catchy and, and which we suppose is they should also be memorable. Uh, they're catchy because uh, the newspaper editors m want to attract your attention in the newsstand uh, so that you buy them. And uh, so this could work as a, as a, as a positive, <coughs> positive thing f if you want to use uh, them as uh, mnemonics. And another um, <coughs> advantage is that they're, they're on a 
they, you can find them on a variety of topics. So if your user is uh, more interested in sports, you could, you could uh, uh, find uh, mnemonics for the user from sports headlines or you know, if they're more interested in, in uh, a stock market, you could find uh, news from the econom e economics news and, and so forth. And another advantage is that they're, they're, they're abundant. You, there are so many newspapers, and you can also reach them from the, from the web. So you can, you can actually uh, create a large, uh, large collection of newspaper he headlines uh, very easily. And also, they're, they're available in many languages, which is uh, very important if you want, to provide, if you want this to be uh, portable to other, other countries and other languages. So let's look at it. let's look at an example newspaper headline. Uh, this is from uh, New York Times. Uh, Red Cross volunteer is arrested in theft of uh, debit cards for aid. So if you use the first letters of this uh, of the words in this in the sentence, you get uh, R C V A T D C A, which looks uh, pretty random. <coughs> and if you use the second letters, you get another uh, random random sequence of uh, uh, letters and if you use the the third letters, you could use another um, random sequence. So you could you could potentially use these uh, headlines as, as as mnemonics. But there are there are challenges while you're using the newspaper headlines. Um, well, of course, uh, we we said that we can we can uh, build a large collection of headlines uh, f uh, to use as mnemonics. But the problem is that. As you remember, we have a we have a huge password space. Actually, uh, you can never store that many headlines. Uh, so you cannot you cannot store uh, one headline uh, per password. And another problem is that the newspaper headlines are public. They are in the newsstands. So uh, you cannot assume that they are actually uh, uh, secret information. So you cannot. You have to be very careful when when you're when you're using uh, this kind of pa public information as your mnemonic, uh, because the adversary can use the same information to break your password. And um, and uh, the newspaper headlines have uh, regularities beyond the daily language because uh, they have they have to adhere to a specific style and they use uh, uh, a restricted voc restricted vocabulary for their. Um, for the for the words they use. <clears throat> Here's the system that we have we have proposed in the AXAC by uh, Sundar Jayaraman. Um, in this system, uh, first uh, a collection uh, the. The newspaper headlines are collected in a corpus, and a random password generator uh, generates passwords. That can, uh, and what we do is, uh, for the generated passwords, we do a search in the corpus to find out whether we can find the mnemonic sentence as a headline in the corpus. Obviously, um, most of the passwords are uh, just go to the trash bin because we cannot find uh, mnemonic sentences for those passwords. So what we propose in that paper is that uh, instead of just using the headlines by themselves, we can produce a huge set of uh, variants of those headlines by using uh, linguistic uh, transformations and reduce the number of re rejected uh, passwords uh, substantially. <coughs> so let's look at what we mean by uh, these sentence variants. Um, here, our example sentence is Uzbekistan courts foreign oil investors. Uh, we first, uh, our system first does a um, uh, part of speech annotation and finds out that this is uh, this uh, sentence, uh, the, the, first let, the first word is a noun, the second word is a verb, the, the third is an adjective, and a noun and another noun. And what we do is we do a lookup in the word net uh, which is a collection of uh, uh, words and their relationships in uh, English words and their relationships. So we do a, a lookup for Uzbekistan with uh, in the noun sense, 
and uh, we find out that actually uh, there are there are related words in the word net uh, that have this that have the same sense. So we found out that uh, maybe we can replace Uzbekistan with Afghanistan, Bahrain, China, or India. And then we 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 do the same search for courts, and we found we find out that chases, solicits, romances, and part uh, partners and users are uh, slightly related to this word, and so on. So what we have is, in this case, we, we create a table uh, of the words that can be uh, used as replacements, repla replacement words in, of the um, original sentence. And we use these replacement words to find out uh, a large number of uh, sentences. So if you, if you look at this, um, in this case, uh, we have a small table, but the number of sentences that we can generate from this table is the um, is the the number that you get by multiplying the number of words in each column. So here is an example sentence: China solicits international petroleum financiers. Another is India partners foreign oil, foreign fuel oil businessmen, and uh, Bahrain romances international Greenlanders. So. Um, the assumption is that uh, if the original sentence is memorable, if it has a story, the the derived the sentences will also have a story, and they will they they might be memorable by the by the users. And what the user does is, as soon as they remember their mnemonic sentence, they just extract the first letters of the of this uh, mnemonic sentence, and that would be their password. Of course, obviously, uh, this this scheme has limitations. Uh, first of all, the password alphabet is only consisting of lowercase symbols. Uh, and we know that ideally we want uh, uppercase characters as well as symbols and numbers in, in, a, in a random password. And also, it's hard to provide um, uh, long passwords because, uh, you know, in that case you have to have a sentence of uh, at least eight words. And um, the newspaper headlines tend to be short. Uh, fortunately, they, 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 uh, they're, they're, you can find a large number of uh, newspaper headlines that go up, uh, more than eight, eight words. And uh, because of these limitations, you can only achieve a, a partial coverage of the, um, the potential password space. And, uh, and because of the limitation of the, our, our sentence generation scheme, uh, some of the sentences that we produce are, are not grammatical. Um, and another drawback is that bec uh, the sentences that we generate this way are hard to, you know, we cannot we cannot easily evaluate the quality of these passwords. That is, um, uh, we don't we cannot uh, quali uh, quali we cannot find out whether they are they are memorable or they are even grammatical after we uh, we produce them. And uh, another drawback is that. Uh, we have seen that most of the users have m many passwords to remember, and um, in this case, we, uh, the user has to remember a different mnemonic for every different password. So, um, in the rest of the presentation, uh, we're going to talk about how can we overcome these limitations. Um, as a clue, uh, we're going to investigate. We are going to investigate whether we can write down write down these passwords. And uh, we're, we're trying to find out whether we can do this without compromising from the security of our passwords. Um, Jasper Johansson and Bruce Schneier have, uh, have suggested writing down your passwords. Uh, so if you write down your passwords, passwords uh, they become, uh, rather than something you know, they become something you have. And the rationale behind it is, uh, you rarely, uh, you rarely uh, uh, lose your uh, credit cards, and you're actually good at. Um, well, I see someone smiling. So maybe m a lot of us are are good in, um, you know, keeping a, p a piece of paper secret, and it might it might be a good idea to actually let your users write down their passwords. So. In this case, you will have your users write down their passwords. But the problem is that, obviously, if uh, somebody uh, gets hold of this password, they can immediately uh, use it and, and authenticate themselves as, as, your, as you. 
So our approach is to complement complement this uh, piece of paper um, with sec secure password mnemonics. So rather than it being only something you know, uh, something you have, um, the adversary now has to have access to something you know, which is a mnemonic sentence. So when they steal the, uh, the, the piece of paper that has your password, they will not be able to authentic immediately authenticate themselves. So the name of the system that we propose is Empathy. Uh, it stands for uh, Reusable Mnemonics for Password Authentication. Um, as our just like our previous system, it uh, uses automatically generated mnemonics, so uh, the users don't have to uh, are not burdened with uh, generating their mnemonics. And uh, also, the, the mnemonics that uh, the, the scheme and the mnemonics that we provide uh, can support truly random passwords. And um, the most important benefit of empathy is that it can handle uh, multiple passwords with the same mnemonic. Remember, in the, uh, in the previous scheme, we were able to only remember one password per mnemonic. We were, go we were looking at either the first letter or the second letter, uh, and, and we, were, we were extracting one password per mnemonic. And the, uh, so, the most important advantage over the, the previous scheme of uh, empathy is that uh, if you uh, you can uh, if if somebody gets hold of one of your passwords as well as your uh, one of your passwords they, they cannot get any for any any information about your other passwords. If you think about the previous scheme, you could actually um, use the first letter for one password, second letter for another password, and the third letter for another for yet another password. But the problem is that. Um, because there are uh, regularities in the English language, let's say uh, if uh, you know the, the first letter of your word was Q, uh, the second letter of your uh, your word will definitely be a U. So uh, your, you, you, the, the security of your uh, of the second password was compromised in the previous scheme. So with empathy, we achieve uh, that we, we make sure that uh, such such uh, situations do not occur. And um, also, we let the user to write down a complete description of their password. Of course, uh, this is a complete description for the user uh, who has the information about the mnemonic. And uh, we also, we also uh, achieve uh, easy user reconstruction of the, of the passwords. And um, we, we can also, do, we, we, we also do this uh, without any requirement of an additional computational power. Um, this, we don't require the user to have a PDA or um, not even a, a, a calculator. And uh, a big advantage of our system is that we don't require a change to the existing infrastructure. So you could go ahead and use this um, on, on, your, uh, on your Yahoo account without Yahoo knowing that you're using this system. And also, you don't have to change your passwords to use this, this system. You can actually keep your passwords and continue using the system. And then when you have to change your passwords, you can, uh, you, can, you can do interesting things. I'm going to talk about that. Which is, uh, you can actually keep the mnemonic and change your password. Um, think about it. Uh, if, if, there's a, if there's a policy that forces you to change your password every day, uh, well, you cannot you cannot do it when you when you have uh, one mnemonic for password per password, uh, even if you use mnemonics. But with empathy, we, we we can achieve this. That is, like you can keep your mnemonic and keep changing your password. And let's see how we achieve this. Um, first, we select a mnemonic sentence, um, which is. Uh, so the system first generates a, a list of uh, pr uh, possible mnemonics for the user, and the user uh, chooses one of them to his or her liking. And then um, we, choose a, uh, we choose a set of strong passwords, which are um, preferably generated by a random password generator. And then um, our system generates a helper card uh, that combines that combines both of uh, that by combining the two information 
um, the, the mnemonic sentence and the set of passwords. And the user then can authenticate, uh, the users can authenticate themselves by using uh, their helper card. Let's run through a sample session of authentication. Assume that um, this, is our, this is our mnemonic sentence. The birth of ice cream, why and how we sneeze at midnight. Uh, we generated this, uh, this password out of a, um, a, a Slate article, I guess. And um, I don't remember the original sentence, sorry. So here is our helper sheet. In the helper sheet, as you see, there, there, uh, there are several tables. And um, on the columns, uh, the, the, the column headers, we have the letters of the alphabet. And, and we have, in this case, we have three tables. Assume that for our first, uh, first system, uh, the, the mnemonic word is birth. And we're going to use the first table in this, in this card to authenticate ourselves. If you look closer, on the left side of the first table, uh, you see that our, our user has chosen to write down the, the, the name of the system that uh, she is going to use to authenticate. And um, also, the first four letters of the password are written in clear over there. And the leftmost column of the table actually holds the indices of the letters that we're going to use out of this um, mnemonic word in the authentication process. The the, the letters of the word are indexed uh, with positive integers uh, uh, left to right and negative integers uh, right to left. So, in order to authenticate ourselves, we first uh, write the first uh, four symbols of the password and we just type them. It's T minus uh, question mark four. Um, to find out the first letter of the, uh, the, the, the remaining part of our password, we look at the first row. And uh, the, the index column of the first row, say, first row says that we are going to use the first letter of our mnemonic word, which is a B. And what we do is we do a lookup of, look of the column B in the first row and get the exclamation mark as our, uh, as our uh, password letter. We do the same for the second row. In this case, we're going to use the uh, letter with the index 4, which corresponds to T. We look up T, in the second row we get 5. Uh, we do the same for the third row. Uh, this time we have the index minus 3. Minus 3 corresponds to the letter R, which um, if you look up the Rth column, we get uh, the, the letter capital F. And if you do, the, do it for the, uh, the, first, uh, the fourth column, uh, we get the letter V. So as you see, we were able to construct the uh, construct a random password out of uh, this mnemonic word birth. Um, now let's let's look at the the table here. If the adversary gets this gets uh, hold of this table, uh, they can readily get the first four letters of your password. But the the remaining four letters they have to um, they have to find out from from this table. And in this table, I guess we have. Um, we have nine unique letters in each row, which means that uh, they have um, we, uh, they have to they have to they have a password space of nine to the four um, to uh, defeat this uh, the, 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 this uh, table. And let's see, the helper card actually uh, acts as a as a as a secret sharing uh, mechanism. So the, the secret that you're sharing is, is, the, is, the, is the random password. And you're sharing it uh, bet uh, between a random, uh, random secret that is inherent to the system that you, you, don't, you don't know about. And also there is a public, uh, the, the XOR of this uh, password and that's uh, random is, is public and it is stored in the, in the helper, helper card inherently. And what you do is actually you do um, um, the the the, ran the random is encoded in your uh, mnemonic word, and you can decode your mnemonic. You can decode the mnemonic word, decode, decode the mnemonic word, and get the random uh, by a le letter by letter deconstruction. And 
uh, after you, you deconstruct that uh, secret, you can do an XOR and XOR with the uh, w with what you store in the, in the helper and uh, get your uh, password letter. Of course, uh, because we can do this automatically by just doing one lookup, um, the helper actually uh, the uh, the helper is actually doing uh, when you do a lookup in the uh, helper sheet, you actually do two things at the same time. So the decoding function actually um, converts your mnemonic into the random string, and it can map longer words into k letters. Rem remember, we were just using uh, four letters out of the let's see, five five letter uh, word birth, and um, you can also use uh, you, the the decoding function um, works. Uh, uh, Make sure that you, you get the maximum number of uh, password space out of these limited number of words. And uh, the decoding function is computed offline so that uh, you don't have to do these computations that we, were t we talked about. And um, while constructing the decoding function, we do a, a heuristic search. The details of this um, decoding function you can find in the, in the paper. Uh, so I'm not going to go to much detail of it. Let's look, let's look at uh, closer to the security of the helper card. So um, we analyze the security of the helper card uh, by looking at two different types of adversaries. The first adversary has is the, is the adversary that would do a brute force or uh, attack or a dictionary attack. So we know that this adversary has the password file. So uh, because our passwords are random, uh, because they were remember they were generated by a, a random number random password generator this adversary has no luck they 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 uh they have to go through all um 94 to the uh eight probable passwords you know they they will probably be able to do it with half of it but this is the password space that they are dealing with um another adversary is the adversary who has uh who has access to the helper card so if you if you left your helper card on your desk or if you if you lost it, so uh, this adversary actually uh, can do, can, uh, is in a better is in a good shape. Uh, but the problem is that this adversary has to uh, perform login trials. That is like if they're trying to access your uh, your Yahoo account or Amazon account, they they have to uh, they have to go through a password space of nine to the four uh, nine to the four uh, possible passwords. And we know, as you all know, that um, the system, the, most of the systems regulate uh, password trials. And in many systems, if you just fail three times, you have to reset your password. So we think that this should be uh, th this helper sheet should be used in conjunction with that kind of policies. The advantage of the the. The most important advantage of this system is that it can handle multiple passwords. So let's look at an adversary who has one of the passwords. Because we, uh, because we made sure that uh, the, 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 the words in the words in the mnemonic are independent of each other, a, a, an adversary who has one of the passwords will not be able to get the other passwords. And also, uh, even if, sorry, even if they have uh, th that happens even if they have the the helper sheet. If they don't have the helper sheet, remember the the passwords have been generated independently from each other, so the adversary has no luck. So they have they are equivalent to not knowing anything about the, the previous password at all. Um, we use a similar mnemonic generation as the previous system. And uh, but what uh, what we do differently is that um, we make sure that uh, we make sure that the probability of a, of a word given the previous word is uh, the same as the probability of that word by itself. So this makes sure that if uh, if an adversary gets hold of uh, your your one of your mnemonic words, they will they will have no clue about the next mnemonic word, which will provide the security of the the password encoded by that uh, mnemonic word. Um, <clears throat> as a conclusion, 
uh, we think that the people are good in uh, keeping their um, the piece of paper uh, secure, and uh, we know that many of the users, uh, a lot of users, use an already use mnemonics. Um, and uh, the, we have, I have presented you two systems uh, for uh, for using mnemonics to help uh, to make the password authentication more usable. And the second one uh, was a first step for using uh, mnemonics uh, for, for multiple passwords. And the systems that we propose uh, uh, combine uh, good security with good usability. And, uh, and a very important advantage of the system that we, we, uh, we proposed was that uh, it enables periodic password changes. Because uh, remember, uh, the mnemonic sentences are, are chosen independently from the passwords. So what you have to do to change your password is just to print a new helper sheet. So you can actually change your passwords every day if you want to. And um, now you can, you can if, if uh, in uh, many practical systems, uh, you have to actually share your passwords. Uh, if you're using a shared uh, device or a system which uh, requires uh, sharing uh, accounts among uh, different users, now, uh, you can actually do this without uh, having to share your mnemonic or compromise from your mnemonic. And um, if, uh, if uh, our users um, make use of the, the helper sheet, they can easily recall their rarely used passwords because now the rarely used passwords are tied with the frequently used passwords. And they can easily remember, because they can easily remember uh, their mnemonic, they can just look it up in their helper and uh, get the rarely rare used passwords. Um, a, a related work, uh, another related work will appear in uh, Usenix uh, 2007. Uh, the title is going to be is Authentication in Constrained Environments. So uh, the problem that we're dealing with in that case is um, can, you, can you log in using your iPod or, or your GameCube? We know that uh, these devices do not have a keyboard and they have very limited input capabilities. And also, um, in cases where uh, people are uh, suffering from uh, permanent or temporary disabilities, like a broken uh, arm or a broken wrist, uh, they might be limited to a binary switch. Uh, so how can you authenticate a user by just using a binary input? Can you remember a very long binary sequence? Or how can you use that input uh, for for authentication uh, with uh, truly random passwords? Uh, thank you. This is going to be the end of my talk. We have just a little bit of time for a question or two. Yes. Um. You, you talked about different kind of attacks and, and user behavior a lot. Did, have you come up with any framework, any construct, which relates, for example, the success rate of the attack and the user's behavior? For example, these, beha these users change this kind of password. This is the hit rate for the attack. And this is the contract construct. They fall in this category. Have you done such a thing? Any regression analysis, any modeling? Um, unfortunately, we didn't do that kind of, uh, uh, you know, user studies. <coughs> but um, there, there is a, a, a large, a, a huge literature about this kind of uh, work. Um, so, what people do is they actually do controlled uh, tests. Um, the, uh, for instance, one uh, one experiment by uh, Jan and others was. Um, that they, they, they took uh, 400 subjects, 400 users, and they gave uh, different, uh, um, different guidelines to create their passwords. So we had, they had uh, four groups of 100, and each of them were given different guidelines. And what, uh, what happened then was the, the password files of these groups were attacked. And, and they were able to, they were able to find out, or, uh, they were able to find out the, the uh, the characteristics of these uh, different types of people, different types of uh, users, uh, you know, which dif which differ by the guidelines they they created their uh, passwords, and there are other similar uh, works. Um, 
you know, I think uh, Adam Sansa. If you if you uh, want to read more papers, there, Adam Sansa is. Uh, they they have a group and uh, they have a lot of papers about this. And uh, Jan is one. And yeah, there, there are others. <coughs> if if you look at the references in our papers, you can you can reach the other the, those papers. I guess how usable is really a system like this for people in big corporations? I mean, uh, I mean, uh, anywhere that I've worked in, people, I mean, even they write down their password because they hate remembering it. Yes. But then they have this big helper card that they have to look at. Yeah. I, I don't know how big it is, but I mean, they actually have to it kind of. It's as big as a credit card, actually. Okay, and they kind of have to still decode their password, and yeah. by that time they're going to kind of get frustrated. Absolutely. I mean, okay, and, yeah. And, and, and then. My other question is, if an attacker had, uh, or an adversary has uh, access to empathy, for instance, and they enter in a dictionary of, uh, of different mnemonics, can they actually generate all these different helper cards and run a dictionary attack uh, based, on, based on the results that they have acquired in a dictionary file? Yeah, that's the, that's the um, so okay, I'll, I'm going to first answer your second question. So in if you if you remember sorry yeah if you remember in our usage scenario the the generation of the mnemon the mnemonics and the passwords are are independent from each other so even if i give you your your mnemonic now okay so you don't have any passwords right now. I give you all your mnemonics that you're going to use. You have no information about your password. So think about the same about uh, for for the for the adversary. Even if they know all the mnemonics that you you're going to use, they have no idea about what your passwords are, because potentially the 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 space of all the mnemonics is equal to the space of your passwords. So they 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 do not get any information even if they can. Uh, even if they have the, the mnemonics, the, the mnemonic sentences. I, I don't know whether I'm clear about this. Okay, and what about the first question? Okay, the first question. So think about, think about the, the helper card as a, as a way to uh, first learn your password because, you know, uh, the, the critical time for, for learning a password is the, you know, first couple of weeks because um, in, a, in another, stu in another uh, study, I'm not sure about who, who it, so I, I'm not going to give who, who did it, but this, the, the thing is that um, I think it was young. So uh, the users were told to write down their passwords until, uh, and keep, them with, keep, keep those uh, pieces of paper uh, with them as long as um, they, they cannot remember it. And the users uh, carried those pieces of paper up to five weeks. So, but after five weeks, usual, uh, users didn't have any problem remembering or recalling their passwords. So think of this helper sheet as a, as a way to write down your password to recall later. So if you want, <coughs> after, you, after memorizing your password, um, you can just throw it away. It's just a better way than writing your password in clear, in this sense. In another, in another sense, uh, remember, uh, if you want to, if you want to enforce, uh, you know, password changes for every day, okay. Um, currently, even if you, uh, you know, this is it's very hard to achieve uh, for for maybe a piece of paper. It's a so it's maybe um, it's more more uh, secure than just writing in a, it on a piece of paper. And also, if you um, if you use, uh, let's say, a system. Very infrequently, let's say you're you're actually uh, located in Atlanta and you just come to Chicago every uh, couple of weeks and you have a system here and you don't use it frequently. So it's better than maybe uh, just uh, having different pieces of paper for different passwords uh, and um, I don't know maybe uh, and also it's better than just uh, trying to remember those passwords without using any, any any helper. That's what I can say. Get, need to get out of here before we get kicked out and close the room up. We'd like to thank you. Thank you.